Welcome F11 members to this month's video tutorial. Last month in Paris we looked at how to use tilt and shift lenses in a city with an architectural scene to use the shift function to keep all the verticals absolutely true and parallel. Today here in the Lynn of Tummel in the beautiful Scottish Highlands I'd like to show you how we can use the tilt function to achieve optimum depth of field. So here in the Lane of Tumble I've pieced together a picture which is probably not going to be the best I've ever shot but in terms of illustrating the use of a tilt shift lens it's perfect. I want this rock here just I don't know about 10 centimeters from the front of my lens element. I want that as foreground interest, nice and sharp. I also want the, the waterfalls in there in the middle distance sharp, and I want the hills in the distance sharp as well. I want that depth of field right through the picture. The traditional way of achieving that is just to stop the lens down, but there's always a limit to how much depth of field can be achieved by that method. With a tilt and shift lens we can achieve that kind of depth of field by using a little bit of drop tilt. In the very first issue of the Chasing the Light online magazine I did a feature on the theory behind the use of tilt and shift lenses and considered the Schleimflug principle, which is a great dinner party conversation stopper, it states that we need to consider three planes when we're putting together a landscape photograph. So if I think of the three planes that I need to consider, the first is the subject plane, and if we draw a line between this rock and those hills in the distance, that is the subject plane. The lens plane is a plane that if we were to draw a line down through the lens, that would be the lens plane. The lens plane and the sensor plane normally are parallel, but with a tilt and shift lens, we have the ability to droop the lens, to alter the lens plane. And finally, the sensor plane, or the film plane in Schleimflug's uh, day, is a lens, a line drawn down through the sensor. The tilt shift lens enables us not to just shift the lens up and down, but actually to alter the lens axis with this, the tilt function, up or down. So the first thing I do, as we did last month in Paris, is frame up my shoot shot and get the camera absolutely level and perpendicular. The next thing I'm going to do is actually get an exposure reading using manual exposure mode, because as soon as I start dialing in any lens movements, the camera's metering system goes haywire. So if I've set an exposure of a 30th of f11 in manual mode, I can always fine tune that subsequently, but that's a good starting point. So now what I need to do is to get the angle of view I want, and I want to look down to include this rock here in the foreground, but I don't want to angle the camera down like this, because then by doing that, the trees in the frame up the valley would all start to lean in on themselves. So I'm going to use the shift capability of the lens. Using live view here now, and just shift the lens down until I get the angle of view I want. So now I've got my composition all sorted. Uh, exposure set. 
Now what I want to do is determine how much tilt I need to use to get the depth of field I need for the picture. How much is the big question. We need to consider Schleem Flux Law. Schleem Flux states that if all three planes, the subject, lens and sensor plane, intersect at the same point, we will have perfect happiness in our lives and optimum depth of field. So that means the sensor plane here is now completely perpendicular. So that's projecting down here to the rocks below. The subject plane is coming in from the hills there in the distance to this rock here and intersecting again down here at the rocks. So we need to dial in tilt so that the axis of the lens intersects at the same point. The thing is though, in practice in the field, it's not really that practical to start drawing these diagrams and calculating the intersection of planes. There's actually a far easier and more practical way of doing this. So the first thing I do is need to focus the lens on infinity. I can either do that by peering through the eyepiece or using live view. I'll, I'll use live view today. So let's activate live view. Let's then magnify the view and go up to the waterfalls in the distance, focus on them. And that's the focusing sorted out. So the next thing I need to do is dial in a bit of Concord's nose, drop tilt, to bring the foreground, these rocks here, into sharpness. And as I do that, looking at the screen in live view, I can see that foreground interest become sharp. So now if I check my focus, I've got that wonderful detail in the foreground is all sharp. The waterfalls in the distance are sharp as well. And the hills beyond. Often just a few notches of tilt here on this scale is enough to just bring in the depth of field I need for a landscape. Most people make the mistake of giving it too much. So now I'm good to go. So what I do is basically make a test exposure at a medium range aperture. I've got f11 here. And then just check that my depth of field is adequate. <laughs> always, always spare, carry spare batteries. So now I do a test exposure and now I'm just going to zoom in and test my sharpness right throughout the frame. And hey presto, I've got sharpness from my foreground interest all the way through to the trees in the distance. All because of the joys of tilting and shifting. Schleemflug's principle in operation. It sounds very dodgy to me. He was a captain in the Austro-Hungarian army. Well, how come he had time to take pictures then? Well, good question. So let's just recap here. Get the camera absolutely level and perpendicular. Use shift to get the downward viewpoint that's necessary, or upward viewpoint for that matter. Focus on infinity. Expose manually. And then use droop tilt to bring the foreground into sharpness.
It's as simple as that.